next guest is someone who I first appeared on stage with in 1994. I'm not, I'm not sure he remembers it. We were both uh, speaking at an NTT event in Japan about the future of the internet. Craig appeared at that point by video, which in 1994 was, was quite remarkable. Uh, Craig is uh, Microsoft's chief research and strategy officer. And the reason I wanted to have Craig here to talk with us is, first of all, because Microsoft is one of the great platform providers in uh, you know, the history of the technology industry and obviously knows something profound about how to make successful platforms. Uh, but also because as the chief research and strategy officer, he's somebody who is tasked with thinking a lot about uh, the future of technology. And it's really critical that when we start building applications, uh, uh, technology applications, whether in the private sector or, or, or for government, that we think about the future and where the future is taking us so that we don't build for yesterday's technology, uh, particularly in a world where we have long procurement cycles. Uh, it's really important to shoot ahead of the curve rather than behind the curve. And Craig is here to help us uh, think about that. Can you please welcome Craig Mundy. Thanks, Craig. Tim. Okay. Maybe over here. So, I really wanted to uh, start with a conversation about how you see technology changing over the next uh, three to five years and how that might actually affect this discussion of Government 2.0. I think that some of the biggest changes uh, in the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, it, of the technology platform are going to actually occur in the next five to ten. And almost everything that we think about, the computer itself, uh, the model of interaction, how we write programs, the basic assumptions about connectivity, uh, the role of the <coughs> cloud-based environment, you know, relative to the local computing environment, all of these things are going to change in some fairly substantial ways. Um, the microprocessors are all going to change architecturally, become wildly more powerful, uh, and, and yet more efficient and cost about the same. Uh, I think we're going to see <coughs> novel forms of radio communications emerge that'll make it uh, easier and less expensive around the world to get connectivity, sort of like Wi-Fi on steroids. Uh, I think that, you know, we've seen a huge, uh, you could say a couple decades where the personal computer was clearly a big platform uh, that emerged and empowered a lot of people, developed a lot of applications. And along came the internet uh, and, and web browsers and email and, and then uh, all the things like, you know, tweeting and Facebook and social networking all were built on that. But those two worlds were somewhat separate. There was sort of the world of the internet and the world of the local computing. And I think one of the biggest changes is in the future, we'll think of that as one big distributed system. And, uh, and we'll write applications that are uh, spread I think Clay Shirky them. told the story about that in 2001 at my first conference on this topic of uh, the Internet as platform. And he, he said, you know, uh, Thomas Watson once uh, said that he saw no need for more than five computers in the world. And Clay remarked, we now know that he was wrong. Right. And everybody thought of the hundreds of millions of PCs. And he said, we now know that he overstated the number by four. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and that is, in fact, you know, a lot of where we are headed. Uh, you know, big global computer with services uh, that are accessed by a variety of devices. Yeah, although the thing I think will change also fundamentally is the model of man-machine interaction. Yeah. And so, you know, many people would say, well, if I could compute it all in the cloud, can I just make the, the local device simple? And, and I think the answer is the local device will become, in some ways, technologically even more sophisticated. But a lot of that sophistication will be used for the part of the interaction that you can't really remote uh, yeah. the computation of, and that's the man-machine interface. I think there's amazing experimentation. Uh, what's the name of the game that you guys are developing where you've got the cameras looking at you and your body is, in fact, the game yeah, controller? Yeah, you are the controller. That, that's a perfect example where, you know, gestures and machine vision become an integral part of how you interact with, in that case, the game. But, you know, I, I've given a demo recently of using exactly the same kind of technology to just interact with your computer in an office environment. And, and you can essentially gesture and move things on walls and get very large display environments. Right, even in an intermediate stage, we're starting to see applications that are starting to use a phone as if it were a 3D mouse, just sort of right. waving it around and using the, you know, the uh, accelerometer in there to, to control so some other application. For this conference, I think it's particularly important to, 
to focus a lot on this evolution of the, of the user interface because you know the, the fundamental role of government you could say is to provide services and they have to be provided in a very universal way uh, and one of the big questions that's always presented is you know how do the you know the less technologically advanced or the people who don't have access to a lot of these technologies how do they get those government services and so everybody wants to move in that direction and government is always faced with the challenge both in this country and elsewhere how do I make it more uniformly available? So I think Do you have an opinion about the whole digital divide? Is that something that eventually technology just catches up with, or do you need to be well, aggressive it, efforts to deal with that? I, in a way, I believe that the consumerization of information technology, which is well underway, will go a huge distance toward eliminating this digital divide. Right. Even in the poorest places in the United States and, and elsewhere in the world, uh, people have televisions, and That's increasingly right. they have oh, cell, in fact, cell phones. In, in some countries, they've got, you know, I was just uh, interested in some of the things you've got in Africa on the mobile world. Uh, it'd be great if we had those services here. Right. <laughs> and so I think the combination of television, cell phones, you know, low-cost personal computers, all of these things getting down into this price point, you know, of a 100 to 200 dollars, which is really pretty much here today, is going to mean that there's no reason that almost any person in the society won't own the technology to get it, and those few that don't, you know, will be able to get it in some kind of shared access environment. But what kinds of uh, things should government be thinking about doing uh, to move this along faster, or should government just get out of the way like John Culberson would like it to do? I, I actually think of the problem in two separate halves. Yeah. There's the problem of what can we do to use advanced technologies to make government services more efficient, more available. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're looking at health care or education or almost any problem. Government really has sort of three separate issues. They have the question of access. How do people get, you know, uh, access? They have the question of outcomes. Are, you know, for what money goes in, do we get a good result out? And they have the question of cost containment. Uh, and, and I think that information technologies in particular give us a new set of tools to address each of those three things in part. One, you know, in, in any area we choose to apply them. I mean, the one I've framed is actually, you know, we have such huge problems that if we can save money, uh, we can spend it on other things that need doing more. Right, but I think that, that is true in every one of these disciplines. So, yeah. for example, you know, I mean, a lot of the discussion today around health care in this city is about access. Yeah. And it doesn't really contemplate very much yet how technology might actually change the whole practice of medicine or dramatically lower the cost of delivering services. How do we do that in, in the private sector? You know, if a company comes up with a killer, you know, idea, killer app, uh, they're able to displace the competition. Uh, but governments are forever, or at least until you know, <laughs> a lot longer than companies. We don't have the same kind of creative destruction that we see in the marketplace. How, how do we actually get a better idea into government if, in fact, there's huge entrenched interests that are uh, keeping things the way they are? Well, maybe I'll say the other half of the, the, the way I think about mm -hmm. government is, is its accountability. You know, yeah. to, to any society, the government is ultimately accountable to the people. And, you know, and I think one of the other things that was mentioned this morning and people talk about quite a bit is in this open government sense where they seek transparency uh, is to think of that as the way in which the government holds itself accountable to the people. Mm -hmm. So providing data and allowing people to analyze it is a way of, of expanding on what you might think was historically done through th just through the role of the media. Mm -hmm. and, and we now have a richer way to think about, you know, creating that accountability, that participation. But I think it's, it's very, di you know, the situation gets very difficult when you try to conflate those two things. I think, right. so in this conference, I think it'd be great if you get people to say, look, I'm, I'm here to talk about services and how we can make them better cheaper, more efficient, right. et cetera, and or I'm here to talk about the accountability sure. half, and, and I think the way we approach them will be but a In terms different. of better services, we are in some ways, uh, you could look at all the, the hackers who are building these outside government services, you know, everything from every block or uh, uh, the My Society stuff in the UK. In some sense, people are building alternate interfaces to government services, and now the government is responding to that. What I would see as the heart of this gov a movement is they're saying, okay, wow, they've raised the bar, we got to do some of that too. And now you're seeing these innovative applications coming out of government, partly in response to the private sector or NGOs kind of using government data to create new services. 
And so we are starting to see that, that interface as a fertile area for experimentation and innovation. And that comes because the government is starting now to say, okay, so-and-so did this cool application. How can we make it easier to do more of that kind of thing? Well, I think, and, and you and I have talked for many years about the idea that it's easy to talk about platforms, whether they're data platforms, computer platforms, programming platforms. But every one of these things that has really been big, the personal computer, uh, the internet, the iPhone, they all got launched on the back of uh, some killer application. I mean, PCs got made on the back of word processing and spreadsheets. The internet as a phenomenon was made by word processors and the I mean, by email clients and the web browser. And, uh, you know, the, the iPhone and, and, you know, platforms like that were made on the back that it was just, you know, a great phone experience that integrated the browsing environment well, with the phone. Well, yes and no, though. I mean, if you think about, uh, you know, DOS, for example, uh, existed before you had the killer apps. Uh, but but uh, DOS, uh, yeah, win Windows, you know, drove forward. You know, you had Windows before you had Excel. Uh, but actually, if you think back, I mean, I mean, I, my first experience with the PC was running Lotus One Two Three on DOS. Yeah, it was so a great experience. <laughs> and, and I'm just saying, you know, it was the combination of these things that put power in the hands of the individual. Yeah. Individuals made that purchase decision that they either wanted to do their own word processing or they wanted to create their own spreadsheets, which is a yeah. new way of modeling. Prior to that time, you had to go hire a programmer if you wanted to compute something, or you had to know enough right. uh, programming. And so it was an empowering capability. And so the web empowered people at a whole other level. At a whole people other who weren't, level. Even, weren't even programmers could start to build And so the question is, with the new tools, the, the new models of man-machine interaction, a more natural way of interacting with computing, uh, higher order ways of, of expressing programs, uh, or asking questions of programs, yeah. uh, it, are these the tools that, at least on the government efficiency side, the yeah. services side, really ought to be the focus uh, in, in terms of improving efficiency? But it also seems to me that, you know, following this metaphor of uh, uh, that we're building a, some kind of operating system for the Internet, uh, just as on the PC you have a subsystem to control access to, say, the disk or the keyboard or the screen, now you have subsystems to control access to location or identity or various kinds of really databases. And some of those databases can be richly informed by government data. You know, when you know, we start thinking about location-based services, uh, you know, certainly there are uh, a lot of commercial things. Uh, there's a Starbucks around the corner, uh, but there's also this huge outpouring of applications showing you, you know, EPA data relative to your location or civic information relative to your location. How do you think about sort of the, uh, the information infrastructure of that next generation of applications? Well, I mean, one How thing do we make it better? Really interesting for government people to think about is that there is essentially a new government service, and that is the data service. Yeah. Right? And, and so not all government data is interesting. Some of it, you know, you could say, hey, if we published everything and you parsed it out and said, what would it be good for? Some would be good for the accountability. Yeah. Some would be good for facilitating, you know, an improved UI to the old yeah, government yeah. services. And some would be data that people can say, hey, I'm just glad that that's available now because there's no other source for it, whether it's census data or like the comment this morning about the GPS system. Yeah. You know, well, and I think that, that there is an opportunity, again, to, to think discreetly about each of these things and, and say, okay, you know, my job in the government is make my, my, my services that I've had more efficient, or hey, I've got a bunch of data, and if I made it available, yeah. it would be valuable to the public, and so let's well, figure out a, how that gets used. A really important takeaway is, is think about the citizen as a consumer. You know, the effectively government is trying to make things better for the person who the government is supposedly here to serve. Hey, um, can we put the Twitter feed on the screens down front? And also, uh, uh, if we uh, could take questions from the audience, do we have a mic out there? Um, but l let's sort of continue this, this thread of services. Are there any particular areas where you look at, you know, whether it's healthcare, education, where you say, hey, the government ought to be doing something more aggressively or ought not to be doing something more aggressively? Broadband, another issue. Well, again, <coughs> broadband is a, a place where government policy can affect the outcome in terms of how we, you know, improve broadband connectivity for the country. Uh, I, that's, wh you know, where I made the comment earlier that some of the things that have been changed, like the, the white space decision that happened on election day, yeah. you, know, it, it, you know, I think time will tell, but that that will probably create some 
at least modest revolution. So in, more, in, more unlicensed that, spectrum would be good. More unlicensed spectrum, I think, will create ways to improve broadband connectivity. You know, how the, how the government thinks about the next generation of performance in the backbone of the Internet and how that relates to, uh, to the research institutions in the country. It's sort of like Internet 2, you know, yeah. for the universities. But if you want to make that applicable to a broader array of services or where right. there's a public-private partnership between the government and, and its service functions and some of these other institutions, I think there's some very clever things that could be done there and it, it, and well, you know, it will depend on government taking good actions in order to see those things emerge. So do you see any concerns, you know, we, we tend to think of uh, broadband as wireline infrastructure and yet so much of our future is wireless. Are we thinking enough about, you know, what's the infrastructure that's needed for wireless plus cloud as uh, the dominant paradigm as opposed to, you know, people being wired in their homes or in their schools or in their offices? By the way, I, I, I think, yeah, yeah. I think um, the, the global market for connectivity is going to drive a lot of invention in, in mm -hmm. this space. That in the established countries, you know, uh, we have both some fixed wire infrastructures, whether it's cable or, or mm -hmm. traditional telephone infrastructures, and then we've supplemented them driven by mobile telephony, you know, to provide another form of broadband connectivity. And then in a local area sense, we've, we've put things like Wi-Fi somewhere in the middle. I think that uh, it will be possible to get more advanced wireless techniques than are currently being used in the mobile area in order to provide even higher uh, data rates uh, in a mobile or, or yeah. net, you know, place so where we don't have fixed infrastructure. Do we have any uh, questions from the audience here? If you, if if you want to be recognized, please stand up and, uh, and Gina will come find you. Also, if you could make the Twitter feed bigger on the screen down there, we might be able to read it. Uh, uh, do we have anybody who has a question for Craig? If not, we will keep going. All right. Uh, so then, you can but, read it back there. yeah, we could we could turn around and read it back there. But um, so uh, lessons, uh, you know, Microsoft uh, has been a dominant company for many years now, facing some pretty serious competition. Uh, we have, you know, first the internet coming along. Now Apple has sort of reinvented itself with the iPhone. How do you see uh, the competitive landscape in technology? Uh, shaping up. I, I, I'm not just talking about what's new in tech, but you know, uh, how, how, how are how are companies doing out there? I mean, do we have do we have enough competition in the in the marketplace? I, I think there's a lot of flux uh, mm -hmm. on a global basis in, yeah. in the technology business, and I think that's true in both the software area, uh, the communications area, and even the the end device area. In for many years, I mean, it's 17 years ago I went to Microsoft to start non PC computing. Yeah. All right. And it took so, a lot know, longer than you thought, huh? <laughs> it takes a long time. <laughs> yeah. And that, by the way, is a really important point. I think everybody needs to be aware of in, in something like uh, this government arena. Platforms take a long time to get adopted. I mean, how long has GPS been out there before we started seeing really, you know, ubiquitous location based well, these, services? These fundamental technologies yeah. in which all these things emerge, you know, n none of them, I mean, even though they sort of appear in the public, uh, like they came from nowhere, yeah. you know, have required oftentimes 10 to 15 years worth of diligent development by many that's companies right. in order to make them happen. You know, I talked about the, the parallel computing evolution that's going to happen. You know, I mean, it's, we've had active programs with Intel and AMD and others for more than a decade, you know, getting warmed up for this. Yeah. And so while for the average programmer in the world or the beneficiary in terms of the consuming public who says, ah, I can't believe how fast my you know, yeah. toaster oven computes now, they, they, you know, th that, that may suddenly appear, but it, it will so have been many, many years of effort to get there. Let me ask you about decentralization. It seems to me that one of the aspects of the personal computer revolution that uh, people have sort of forgotten was it was fundamentally a decentralized revolution. Uh, we put the power in the hands of individuals. And the internet also decentralized revolution. We, we put the power in the hands of individuals. So when we look at a problem like, say, the smart grid, uh, are, we still, are we thinking broadly enough? I, I just, the reason I, I'm, I'm thinking about this right now, is I talked with Lynn Wells from National Defense University last night, and he talked to me about this amazing program in Afghanistan where they're, 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 dropping, they're figuring out how to drop in these nodes with distributed hydropower 
uh, distributed cell phone coverage so people can literally, you know, kind of set up this distributed power grid. And I said, God, would be great to have that here? You know? uh, just to kind of bootstrap past this entire monolithic infrastructure that we have and, yep. and work from the other end. When I think of the energy problem, again, mm -hmm. I sort of divide it into two problems. One is long term and forever, there will always be the problem of conservation. You know, the less you need to use, the yeah. better off you're going to be, no matter what your yeah. sources are. And then there's the longer term problem that says if the world ultimately has to mi migrate to an all zero carbon, you know, generation capability, is it, is it going to come from, you know, some zero carbon replacement for the base load generation we have today, uh, like nuclear, in some novel form of nuclear power? Or are you going to go to a fully distributed grid, cogeneration kind yeah. of environment like they have? I, I, I tend to think that we will get distributed action soonest uh, on the conservation side. Yeah. And that's something that everybody can participate in. Uh, you know, Microsoft, you know, we, we built this new product called Microsoft Home and just launched it a few months ago, which is exactly that, a tool to allow each individual to do an analysis to develop a model in a simple way of their home and then make individual decisions about how they can lower their, con their consumption. Uh, absolutely. You know, that brings up such a critical point of how much in the way of Web 2.0 and I think Gov 2.0 is about measurement and so that people get a feedback loop and they can actually respond uh, the, to the data that they're seeing. This ability to, to close that loop where we have a yeah. huge amount of low-cost sensing and data generation capability yeah. and yet, you know, most people can't. Uh, develop a model that says, you know, would I be better if I if I want to get green and you know yeah. my family wants to you know c conserve energy, you know what would I be better to do? You know, double glaze my windows, you know, replace my water yeah. heater, you know, get a high efficiency furnace. I mean, there's a huge amount of information and yeah. modeling that actually for each individual house would allow that to be done. Many people have done that. Department of Energy spent years studying those problems. The question was, how do you put it forward? In our case, we actually took the, the, the work from the Department of Energy, put a web-friendly face on it, put a cloud computing facility behind it, and said, okay, now anybody can answer some simple questions and end up feeding the data that they have into this model. They get their company's energy data, their energy yeah. provider data. So I think this is the kind of public-private partnership where you, yeah. know, you, you put a, an easy-to-use interface on stuff that's very complex, but you, you end up empowering an individual action. All right, so that's it. Ease of use empowers individual action. Good, good quote with which to end our discussion. Okay, great. All right, thank Thanks, you very Dave. much, Greg. Great to see you. Bye-bye.